Hi, everyone. I'm Jules Nasso. Don't go nowhere, because Profiles is coming right up. Welcome to Profiles, I'm Jeanette Ng. Today's guest is movie producer Jules Nasso, who for the past three decades has produced films in Hollywood and independently that have grossed hundreds of millions of dollars. His diverse production credits include Under Siege 2, The Patriot, Prince of Central Park, and Fire Down Below, just to name a few. After a short break, we'll join our host Mickey Burns as he welcomes Jules Nasso to Profiles. Welcome back to Profiles. In the mid-1980s, Jules Nasso partnered up with Steven Seagal and together they formed Seagal Nasso Productions. In 14 years, they produced six action-adventure mega-hits. In 2002, however, the relationship fell apart and ended up in court. What ensued was complex and rivals any soap opera drama. So let's join our host, Mickey Burns, on location at Ashford and Simpson Sugar Bar in the heart of New York City as he welcomes film producer Jules Nasso to Profiles. Mickey, I don't know. I always looked at life like I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. It's just, I don't know what it is. I, I, I always, what keeps me going is the next frontier, is, is the next layer. It's not about financial wealth. Mm -hmm. I don't get up in the morning yeah. and say, you know what, I made a buck yesterday, I gotta yeah. make two today. Uh -huh. What I try to do is I try to create and, and, and you know, it's just part of my life. Yeah. Jules Nasso, welcome to our show Profiles. Thank you, Mickey, it's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Uh, you are, for our viewers, Hollywood film producer and have been for the past three decades. It's been a long uh, ride Just a you. long ride, yeah. It sure <laughs> has. And you've been producing films uh, that really appeal to a wide demographic, almost all demographics. And that, how does one do that? Well, basically, I mean, you know, in order to make a film, you want to make sure that um, you have the viewers. So the first thing we do is we look at the demographics and we look at, you know, the type of films and the genres and sure. what type of audience is going to watch them and how big the audience is. I mean, I've worked on projects just recently where, uh, as opposed to commercial films, you know, um, where they're more in the art category and your mm -hmm. demographics are less, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, so it all depends on the type of film that you're trying to create and uh, where you're going, going with it. Okay. Uh, now you became a giant, really, in the business in the mid-80s uh, when you formed a partnership with Steven Seagal mm -hmm. uh, and formed Seagal Nasso Productions. Correct. Uh, how did the partnership originate? Well, uh, at the time, um, I was very fortunate. I was working with uh, Sergio Leone mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, on a project called In God's Name. Yeah. And um, uh, I came across Stephen. Mm -hmm. I was introduced to him uh, in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, he was just getting ready to prepare, working on a film called Above the Law. He was a big fan of Sergio Leone's. I didn't know that. And um, Were you? Well, I, I, I started with Sergio. I was Sergio's <laughs> assistant. I, 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 I had the honor and, and, and uh, I was blessed to be able to work with uh, one of the best masters in the world, you know, in the film industry. When you first got on the set of mm -hmm. Once Upon a Time in America, what was it about you uh, that caught the attention of Sergio Leone? Well, you know, aside from being a master at what he does, oh. I, I, I noticed one day uh, because he did have a number of ailments, you know, glaucoma, high blood pressure, yeah, you know, etc., etc. And one day I was in the uh, trailer with him, and he says, uh, you know, get me some water. You know, I was an assistant, you know, that's what I was there to do. Yeah. And uh, I seen him take out a little pill box, you know, yeah. of medications. Right. So he counted one of these, one of those, one of these, and uh, he put them all in his hand and, and he gulped them down with the water. So he says, whoa, maestro. I says, what are you doing? I says, that's, that's the worst thing you could do. Especially <laughs> back then, there was a big thing with drug interreactions. Not that there isn't today. Mixing them especially. Mixing them yeah. especially, you know. And he turned around and he says to me, who are you <laughs> to, tell to, me. to tell me how I should take my medicine? Yeah, yeah. I was just a gopher. Right. I says, maestro, I says, I happen to be a pharmacist and a pharmacologist. Well, he looked back and he says, 
what in God's name are you doing here? And I said to him, I says, I could only learn from a maestro. I says, and I can't yeah. learn this in college. I says, I could study it. Yeah. I says, but by being next to you, it's, I says, there's nothing in the world. And that's, that's when he really uh, helped me a took lot. Took you under his he wing. He took me under his wing, uh, yeah. And did, uh, did he take your advice? In medications? Yeah. I, in a crazy way, you know, every time he came out of a physician's office, 10 years after that, he would always ask me, what is this? Okay, is this so okay? He, he wanted to be more informed. We always, always, always called me. I remember he was working, he was in Australia one day, and I was at home with the time difference. It was day and night. He called me uh, in the middle of the night, and he said, listen, he says, I have this big flu, and, and, and I can't get out of bed, and they gave me this stuff here. To make sure that, you know. It's that, okay. Well, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and as the time you spent with him on the film set, uh, what's the biggest lesson you learned from him? The most important thing is how to treat the employees and your workers, whether they were a crew member, a PA, or whether it was the star of the film, you know? And, and also what he was great at was always giving credit to the trades and not being the person that thought he knew everything about every right. trade. That's a great lesson. In 2000 and 2003, uh, the relationship between Stephen and yourself fell apart. Uh, much has been written about it. Ended up in court. As a matter of fact, one article, let me just read what the article said. It said, the whole Nassau Segal story is complex and rivals any soap opera blockbuster. It involves six million dollar lawsuit, a Tibetan religious sect, betrayal, extortion, mafia, FBI, and Hollywood. And when I read that I said, sounds like a great movie. <laughs> 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 you know, it's sad. It's sad because, you know, in our type of a business, you know, uh, as you know, we're open to all kinds of uh, situations yep. that could be blown out of hand. And sometimes star power or evils of star power, if they start getting involved, a little schoolyard fight could turn out to be nasty. Absolutely. You know, and uh, it just got a little out of hand. Out of hand. Of course, as an aftermath of the lawsuit, you ended up doing, I think, nine and a half months in a federal prison as a plea bargain because you didn't want to avoid, you wanted to avoid a long and costly trial. And you said upon your release, you said that the first challenge that you had was rebuilding your image. Why so? Mickey, my, my feeling is, you know, human nature. Uh, if a person's been a bad guy his whole life, and finally something happens or it catches up to him. People corral around and say it's about time it happened. The sad part and, and, and uh, in this whole little situation that got out of hand mm -hmm. was that for, and I'm going to correct you, it was 17 years, not 14. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. In a 17 mm -hmm. year relationship, uh, in a point where we were doing blockbusters every one after another, yep. you know, uh, you really don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that really something wasn't there that didn't make sense. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if any of that stuff was true, yep. why wasn't it happening when we were at the top of the mountain? Good point. Yeah, this is the main house and, and my private offices are upstairs. Uh, and some of the biggest negotiations were done here in film. Right here. Right here, under siege, right. mock for death, out for justice, narc. You know, I just enjoy having, you know, everyone get together here, you know, and uh, what it is is basically there are no distractions. Yeah. That's the yeah. word there's I was looking no, there's for. There's none here. There's no distractions. And then yeah. I have the, the, the people, the players are here. Right. And after they're relaxed and everything else, you really get to know everyone a little bit better. Jules Nasso's greatest achievement in the independent film world came in 2002 when he won the Sundance Film Festival with NARC, starring Ray Liotta and Jason Patrick. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with much more on Profiles after these important messages. Welcome back to Profiles. I'm Jeanette Eng. The Jules Nassau Steven Seagal saga, among other things, involved a $60 million breach of contract lawsuit claiming that Seagal walked out on a four film deal. The case was eventually settled, but for Nassau, the important thing was not the financial settlement, rather, it was rebuilding his reputation and repairing his image. Now back to Mickey Burns with Jules Nassau. Are you satisfied with the way things are today and that today you can move on with your life? Well, Mickey, I gotta be honest with you, I learned a lot from the experience. I realized who the real supporters were over the years and who the parasites were that were just hanging on. 
Now, you also have to remember, during that period, mm -hmm. I never stopped making films. I mean, it went from Prince of Central Park, we did NARC, one Sundance with NARC, right. after NARC, right. One-Eyed King, after One-Eyed King, working with William Masing, right. I, I did a film called uh, In Enemy Hands, mm -hmm. till today, even with The Poet, with Daryl Hannah, you know, and Roy Schneider. Mm -hmm. if, if you look between the lines, you could see that, you know, sometimes we have to do certain things in the justice system to get well, I would say, like, to cut your damages. Sure, and move on yeah. with your life. Move on your life. Mm -hmm. But I do want to emphasize, yes. and this is public, yes. the only thing that was found by the judge mm -hmm. and the prosecutor in my plea and at my sentencing yeah. was the judge, quote, this is nothing but aberrant behavior. You do not plea to a charge for a year based on you know, what the charges originally were. Yes, right, right. And it's that's unheard important. of. That's important. It's unheard of. I mean, you know, it's just unheard of. Right. You know. And you, a famous film producer, ended up having to spend nine and a half months in a federal prison. And I read somewhere that you were thinking... Ten months, <laughs> two weeks. <laughs> and eight hours, right. And I read somewhere that you were uh, planning on writing a book and producing a movie on that experience, which is phenomenal stuff. I mean, it was it was a uh, it was a roller coaster ride, but it did make me a better person. You know, I really have no axe to grind with anyone. I mean, it's just something that happened. And the biggest the biggest hurdle I had yeah. was fighting the star power issues. This is not your ordinary person. No, you know, this is something that I, yeah. together with Stephen, created. Yes. We created that. That image. We created that image. Sure did. You know. Until today, I really have no hot feelings for him, nor does he have for me. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we've been friends and partners, you know, for many, time. many, many years. And sometimes we get bad advice from outsiders. And there might have been a period of time where he was getting bad advice. And uh, it happened to be what it is. Wow. Uh, switching gears. Uh, one of your current projects is serving as chairman for this year's Staten Island Film Festival now in its third year. And we were talking before, and you've experienced film festivals and have to all over the world. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. You know, why, why are they so important to the industry? Well, what it does is it, uh, it, gives, the, um, it gives the independent filmmakers, and there are very, very good filmmakers out there, sure are. you know, that sadly to say don't never have a vehicle or the opportunity That's right. to have their material seen. A lot of people cannot afford to go to the big festivals. That's a good point. It's expensive. You know, it's very, very expensive. So yeah. by having these satellite festivals yeah. nationwide, it gives the students, it gives filmmakers, young, new, energetic filmmakers, the opportunity to get the exposure that their films are warrant. Uh, I, I failed to mention that your film last year, The Poet, you, you did briefly mention it, mm -hmm. which was a World War II love, love story, mm -hmm. won top honors mm -hmm. at last year's festival. And I just want to read a quote that you gave after winning the award. You said, uh, winning that award was a bigger high than walking away with a trophy at Sundance. Mm -hmm. Why so? Well, because it's a, aside from being native, it, it mm -hmm. was more so being in a smaller festival, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and really elbowing with regular people that are blue collar workers, that are just standard people from Staten Island, New York, tri-state area, where it's not all the, you know, uh, fanfare and yeah. balloons and all this other stuff. So I enjoyed it because it was actually the territory, our native territory. Yeah, and you had said, speaking of Staten Island, you reside there, mm -hmm. and on your property, you have built and created what is known as Cinema Nassau Studios. Mm -hmm. Uh, what motivated you to establish this studio on Staten Island? Well, basically, um, because of our work and always doing, the, the majority of our work is really the post-production. Yeah. You know, when we film, as you know, and for, for your viewers that don't know, mm -hmm. what we're doing during filming, we're collecting the raw materials. Yeah. The raw materials to put together and, and, and create a film that you see, whether it's on television or you see it at a theater. Yeah. So the majority of the work and the most hardest part